Welcome back everyone, I've actually got some good news. Live service games are now in a bit of trouble and we can prove it because Sony's crown jewel developer Naughty Dog have uh, cancelled their live service title before it enters its 10th year of development and explicitly they're framing this as a choice between making great single player games or churning out a live service title. This is fascinating, it's an admission that we've not seen to date from a developer this well known and powerful in the industry and maybe it could mean there'll be a genuine sea change happening in devs and publishers with how they think. This is not just prominent first party developers for the biggest player in the console space rejecting a live service, but it's them doing so publicly, loudly, and instead actively choosing single player games. Yet nested within this is an admission that a multiplayer game can't just go out, be released, and be fun. That is not allowed anymore. And as much as that sucks, ultimately, this is good news. Naughty Dog have illuminated a path, one the rest of the industry can follow, and one that leads us straight to today's sponsor. Boot.dev, they're literally some of us. Their founders watch this very channel. And, of course, Code Bellular News gets you a 25% discount off your first payment. But a payment to what, you may ask, and that is Boot.dev, the programming role-playing game that makes learning back-end development fun. It offers you quests, levels, achievements, a global leaderboard, all those things to keep you motivated, keep it fun to make it spicy, but of course there's beans to be earned as well. US back-end developers earn over a hundred grand a year in median salary per stack overflow. And of course, being a programmer, you've often got some real terrific options like working from home if that's something you want to do. Now, what Boot.dev is specifically specializing in is back-end development using Python and Go at your own pace, but very much avoiding tutorial hell, focusing 100% on writing loads of code and going through their platform that is exactly what boot is geared for taking a perusal through the various different topics you can see there's an absolute boatload of content starting off super approachable and then going properly in depth and they're adding new lessons all the time essentially a one-stop shop to allow you to avoid bouncing around youtube tutorial hell getting little bits here little bits there no instead here you can follow a focused end-to-end -end learning path that will have you shipping projects and feeling confident in your coding abilities and if you get stuck well they've got a learning community over on their discord it absolutely slays how i learned to program back in say 2012 in university and you can get started today with 25 percent off your first purchase using code bellular news Right then, the game is cancelled. Now, they had talked about it being in development in May. Of course, at the very end of May, there was a report from Bloomberg suggesting that this was a very troubled project, that the team were being downsized after a milestone review. If you're not aware of how those work in game publishing, be it monthly, be it every two months, you'll have a milestone review, which is basically where your game, or whatever build you have, you send that off, it gets reviewed, Everyone kind of crosses their fingers, hopes nothing breaks, and then you find out. Usually it is, have you got a conditional pass? Have you got a pass? Or is it a fail? And if it's a fail, yeah, good luck unlocking money. Now, obviously, this is a first-party studio, so it's not exactly like that, but still, these things truly do matter. Now, following this news that it was being reevaluated in October, a report from Kotaku suggested the game was on ice and that they had laid off around 25 developers in contracted positions for it. And now, as the year crawls to an end, Naughty Dog have admitted uh, nearly seven months after the initial reporting that this is a dead project. And what's meaningful to me is the way this was communicated and what that means. What kind of lies in between the lines because what's notable about this isn't that a game was cancelled or the naughty dog is walking away from the live service commitment that every sony studio seemingly had to adhere to it is that we haven't learned this from a sony financial statement we haven't learned about this from a last of us part three announcement because in a way both of those would have been the pr play to help to cushion the blow of some bad news but instead naughty dog have just thrown the entire concept of live service games down to take the fall. Their statement actually matters here. They think that public perception has shifted to the point where they can happily scapegoat the genre in favor of making single player games. And here's from their statement. I'm just going to kind of read out for you the important parts. We've made the incredibly difficult decision to stop development on that game. The multiplayer team has been in pre-production since we were working on Last of Us Part 2, crafting experience we felt was unique and had tremendous potential. In ramping up to full production, the massive scope of our ambition became clear. To release and support Last of Us on 
online. We'd have to put all of our studio resources behind supporting post-launch content for years to come, severely impacting development of future single-player games. Almost in a way, not wanting to be so, I don't know, caught up in their own version of GTA Online that they just don't get to make any more GTA. Obviously, GTA 6 is happening, but I think you understand my analogy anyway. That's how a lot of people who love GTA but don't necessarily love GTA Online had ended up feeling. So, we had two paths in front of us. Become solely a live service game studio or continue to focus on single-player narrative games that have defined Naughty Dog's heritage. They end by saying, we have more than one ambitious brand new single-player game that we're working on here at Naughty Dog. So... There's two things to take away from this statement. Thing number one, right? Live service development scope means that there is no middle ground here, that basically it's an all or nothing situation. Now, the second point is that they're now willing to tell audiences that as a press beat because they know that live service is turning into a dirty word and the players have basically turned against loads of what the industry is actively wanting to put out there. So, to get into the scope of live service demand then, as a bit of a reminder here, when Naughty Dog were developing The Last of Us Part II, 2,000 plus people worked in that game, and that includes outsourcing teams across 14 studios who handled specialist elements, things like voice acting and sound design. Now, in Kotaku's reporting, they suggested the internal headcount pre-layoffs was 400 people. There is no way the Naughty Dog did not know how much work a live service multiplayer game would be. And even if you're to assume that this entire live service imposition is something from Sony, who, remember, recently halved the number of live service games they expect to have released by fiscal year 2025 from 12 to six, uh, there's basically no way the team at Naughty Dog didn't know how much work it would be to build and then run a full live service. And the thing is, you kind of need way more than 400 people when a game is at this big AAA scale. And that may sound just madness, but I mean, think about it. Bungie have split themselves between unannounced projects, uh, marathon development, and uh, just Destiny 2. And that's kind of ran aground. You look at the World of Warcraft development team, it's 600 plus people. The Diablo team, I believe, is actually decently larger than that. So, You've got here teams that are, and that's not, I would assume, including other parts of the company that exist to service that team. So loads of these live service games have larger teams than the entirety of the company of Naughty Dog. So whenever they say that they don't think they can do them both, I do actually believe them on that. I mean, of course, if you're to assume that it's absolutely non-negotiable that all of their single-player narrative games are, you know, pushing the industry forward, pushing the craft forward in what they're able to achieve. I would snarkily add, in a technical sense, not in a writing sense, because I think that kind of went backwards recently. Now, based on the statement they made, we can probably assume that the multiplayer team who built The Last of Us Factions, which was, you know, the thing in The Last of Us Part 1, that actually was so surprisingly good that people wanted it to be a full experience, and that basically they've been working on that during the production of The Last of Us Part 2. Now, that is a game that just started development in 2014, meaning... That's almost nine years. Their ambition to have the sequel to The Last of Us Factions has been in development for a decade, pretty much. That's kind of crazy. So with that being in production and then Sony wanting to push more into live services, we can all see how that was spun out into being its own product. And we've seen this from other companies as well. I mean, it's canceled now, but do you remember the cyberpunk multiplayer standalone thing that uh, they were going to do and then they said would be its own thing? And then, of course, they ended up cancelling. It does seem that that pursuit for the multiplayer thing, albeit in a different way to how bolted on multiplayer hurt us in the past, looking at you, Spec Ops, the line, and I think you do just see, like, another echo or reverberation of an industry trend. And what that essentially means for these companies is something that is actually, in a way, quite sad for us. It does essentially mean that you can't just have a multiplayer suite of features. You have to have a full live service multiplayer experience. And to me, it is so disappointing. And it really just sucks that you can't just make an interesting multiplayer side game for your AAA game, throw it in there. And it could be something that, you know, people play for a few weeks, or just do with their friends. No. It cannot be that. It has to be a massive recurring revenue, microtransaction-based live service. 
That's just it. But I suppose I then think about all of the arena shooter revivals that various companies have tried to make happen. You know, thinking about shooters that aren't the big ones that everybody knows about. There are riches in the niches, as they say, you know, if you say go into the milsim genre or, or whatever, but it does seem that that diversity of experience that comes from just, hey, let's do a multiplayer mode if it makes sense. It does seem that's going away. Because I suppose realistically, as players, we've been trained that you don't really play a multiplayer game just for fun. You also play it for mastery. You play it for meaning. You play it for community. So it's as if games that aren't big enough, that don't have that critical mass of content and development pace to just like be an active, almost forever game that somebody could play for a thousand hours. If it can be that, it just doesn't get made. And that's pretty much that. Of course, indies can step in here and fill the gap, but it is so very hard to do multiplayer on an indie scale because, man, getting a lot of concurrent players without having an insane marketing budget or being a runaway sleeper hit, well, that's just damn hard. Now, if you zoom back and actually think about this, right, this is nine years of development on a project that they're presenting as basically being not sustainable for long-term production. And in a way, it kind of means that something doesn't add up. There's a great developer, Brandon Sheffield, who pointed this out. He said, I get this is a public-facing post, but Naughty Dog was working in a multiplayer game for nine years and only just now realized they were going to have to commit their whole studio to making it live service. If that's true, they are making themselves sound incredibly foolish. Most folks working on the game must have known what an undertaking a live service game is because they had to be planning one. So, who is out there saying it will be fine without understanding it? That's going further up the chain. So it's the idea that somebody further up the chain basically can't use a bloody spreadsheet and didn't think about what they were truly asking Naughty Dog to pull off. And ultimately, this is the situation we're left in. So that's it from a developer's perspective, thinking about this realistically. Ultimately, though, the management play that they have made is to focus this less on saying that they're canceling a game and more on saying we are redoubling our efforts and completely focusing on single player and using that as a large marketing point. And that is a monumental shift. So the perception of live service has basically shifted. As they said, we have two paths in front of us, solely live service game studio or continue to focus. And look at the wording there, quote, solely live service game studio versus single player narrative games that have defined Naughty Dog's heritage. Look at the language, the wording there. That is not neutral language. It's not the sort of neutral language that would appear in a Sony financial report that maybe otherwise would have announced this. This is live service being framed as, ba right, basically they're saying we either become just another bloody studio like all the rest of them making this tripe or, or we continue to be what actually makes us us. So basically, they're getting a little bit of kind of rallying around their flag, their heritage. And then, of course, the kicker is, don't worry, they're already working on the next iteration of the games that you love, uh, revealing that they've got more games in development than the one that they've already discussed. So big picture, that's the play. They know what's going on, but there is a bit of a problem. And that just is that The Last of Us Factions was really fun. It was really good. And they've actually hidden replies or, you know, they've, they've stopped other people from replying uh, to this post, which sometimes companies do if there's a little bit of drama just as a kind of, uh, you know, like control measure or whatever. Uh, but big picture, though, there are plenty of people who are disappointed here because actually surprisingly, the gameplay of The Last of Us translated over into factions like remarkably well. It was super fun and so many people loved it. And there absolutely could have been a maybe small, but absolutely healthy, stable community here. But the point is that just ain't enough. And the fact that that just ain't enough is ultimately why for many people, they can feel a little bit betrayed by Naughty Dog right now. Even though obviously this is good news because otherwise what would have happened, right, is that this Last of Us multiplayer game would have been a humongous thing. It would have had seasons. Maybe there would be a narrative uh, woven through that. At the very least, how would you make money from it? Well, you're probably going to need to have mountains of developers making mountains of skins. And then how do you even deal with that? I mean, you could say, and uh, hey, I can give I can give bad, horrible ideas because the game's dead now and a little bit inspired by hyenas, actually. But The Last of Us happens in the future, our future, which, of course, is a future where all of our current brands still exist. So if you want to do a Goku or a John Wick, you actually can do that in The Last of Us. You know, you just have to make it be a sort of aged relic. And I suppose that's the way that they probably would have had to have went. So at least in this way, we don't get to live in that hell. And the main takeaway here is that a big studio was able to say, live service bad. 
in relation to cancelling their own live service. I mean, they didn't say live service bad, but look at the framing. It's, you, you know, we either continue to be the thing that you love or we become just like another studio. You know, it's kind of got a bad connotation to it. So big picture then, this is good. Millions of people, millions and millions of people will see this. Suits will see this. And maybe small moves like this, in addition to say Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, these can actually start to shift the industry into a good direction. I mean, do you remember what EA did to um, Dead Space 3, where it was turned into a strange live service where you could buy crafting materials? Do you remember uh, Star Wars Ragtag that Amy Hennig had worked on, where, you know, so some of the problems that I think that and Star Wars, was it 1313, the sort of bounty hunter-y game? Like, a part of why those games, like, went, in addition to being troubled projects, was, well, this ain't where the market's moving. It's multiplayer, it's not single player anymore. So overall then, this is a really good trend. I feel bad for, you know, there's people around my age and we grew up with this really great era of video games. And then there's people who are coming of age now and are getting to play the likes of, you know, Elden Ring, Star Wars Jedi, you know, that's the formative games that they get to play. I feel bad for the people in the middle who kind of came of age as gamers when a lot of that extremely high quality content just wasn't being made because the whole industry it's just chasing one thing. But of course, many will continue to chase and fail in the pursuit of live service dollar. So this is one win in the battle, but it is not the end of the war. That's it for me. Of course, check out this video next because uh, other very interesting, very spicy, and thankfully good news is going on. That's it for me. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time.